like I said, here we are, Gaudete Sunday, where we, you know, and this happens uh, every penitential season. We take a little break halfway through, um, about, oh, about two-thirds of the way through. Uh, even so, you know, it's been kind of a tough week for the Walsh family. My uncle, who works at the Advent Calendar Factory, he got fired. All he did was take a week off. I don't understand. But, you know, it's not unexpected. Whenever you work with Advent calendars, your days are numbered. That's it. So, all right. Maybe we'll throw in the one I told you, Mary, later on. So, <laughs> okay. You know what? You know how? Well, you already know this one. I told it to them. How many letters in the Christmas alphabet? 25, because there's no L. Okay. So, that's enough of that. <laughs> so, all right, uh, now if any of you were looking for a biblical mandate to participate in the warm clothing drive, I refer you to today's gospel wherein John the Baptist tells the people, whoever has two cloaks should share with the person who has none. There it is in the vestibule. So yeah, go through your closets and other people need warm clothing that you're not using. Or go out and buy something new, you never know. Like I said, the third Sunday of Advent is called Gaudete Sunday for a reason. The word means rejoice. And indeed, the word rejoice, or something similar to it, appears no less than 13 times in the readings for this week. I didn't even get into the prayers of the Mass and the prefaces and all that. So, what are we to rejoice about? You know, think about it. What is, what is there to rejoice about these days? Now, what is given to us in the scriptures? Let's, let's look there. Uh, the prophet Zephaniah exhorts us to rejoice for several reasons. There's not a great, you know, a great uh, passage, you know, rejoice. And he's, he, gives us four, he gives four reasons to the people of his day. One, that the Lord has removed the judgment against us. What was going on? They had sinned against the Lord, abandoned him, and been thrown into exile. That had been forgiven. Great expectation. Thank God for that. God forgave their sins. We know God forgives our sins too. Second, he has turned away our enemies. And boy, there are a lot of things that would seem to mitigate against the gospel even today. But in, in their day, what a great thing. Third, perhaps most important, the Lord is in our midst. Also known as Emmanuel. Um, the Lord is with us. Pretty amazing. And therefore, we have no more misfortune to fear. That's what Zephaniah said to the people. And we can each kind of resonate with one of those, I imagine. Paul also tells us to rejoice because why? Here it comes again. The Lord is near. Literally, within arm's reach is what the reference is. And finally, Luke, in the gospel, this, this very powerful gospel, you could go two ways with this. It kind of has two halves, doesn't it? The first half is sort of the moral. All these people are coming. Why are they coming to John to be baptized? One, because there is great expectation among all the people. They're expecting the coming of the Messiah, and they're getting their act together, and all kinds of people, and not, you know, people that you would expect. These are not the cream of the crop here. These are just people, regular, everyday Joes, the crowd, uh, tax collectors who were, not, who were absolutely reviled. That's why even tax collectors, because they were seen as the most insidious of people, collaborators with the Roman occupying forces. Soldiers. So we're not sure that these soldiers, probably not Roman soldiers, but certainly uh, Jewish soldiers, temple guards, whatever, you know, the local, the local militias, uh, whatever. I'd have to look that one up. But, uh, you know, but there was, you know, the local uh, units, I'm sure. We may be liking them. I don't know if you could liken them to the National Guard. That doesn't really work in ancient times. But they were local guys. These were, these were Jewish soldiers um, who worked with the Romans, obviously. So they were... You know, so, so all these kinds of people are coming that you would not expect because they're expecting the coming of the Messiah, this priest king. Their people were filled with great expectation. And remember, the coming of the Messiah must have been a heady time because there was this great sense that he's, he's, the Lord is near, as the prophet Zephaniah says. And these, these prophecies from Isaiah, Zephaniah, we get today, would have rung very, very uh, clear in their heads and would have been right in the four. This is probably what was being preached in the synagogues as well. Great expectation with all the people. And this great priest king that would come in, kick out the Romans, reestablish the kingdom of Israel. Pretty cool. Of course, God had much greater plans for the people of Israel and for us, thank God. Uh, you know, when these things were going on, my ancestors were still painting themselves blue and worshiping trees. 
But God had a plan, and that plan unfolded, and it unfolds continually even to this very day, right, in this very place, about as far away on the globe as you can get from where these things took place. Pretty amazing how God's plan unfolds over the centuries. And so they were filled with great expectation, even in the midst in what seemed like a very dark time. Now remember, we tend to forget that life was a lot tougher in ancient times. Just physically, let's not get into the politics of it. Let's just talk about, just, you know, just let's talk about health care. About in the Roman Empire and in Palestine, this, this would have been, because we're out from the center of the empire here, we're on the fringes, so we would be at the more extreme end of these statistics. About a quarter to a third of all babies in the Roman Empire did not survive their first year. Infant mortality was 25 to 33 percent. Okay, within the first year. If you made it through your first year, you could expect to live about another 34 to 41 years. That was life expectancy in the first century. There were no old people as we know old people today. Um, to get into your 60s was considered a miracle. To have gray hair was could be considered quite venerable. So death was much more a part of life. Anything could kill you. Any little infection, uh, anything that would come by. There was no penicillin, there were no antibiotics, there were no vaccines. You just had to deal with whatever came your way and had it, it would run its course. So death was much more a part of life and so this gave an urgency to things. Life literally was short and so there was an urgency to all these things. And in our own day then too, you know, Advent should have a certain urgency to it. Not necessarily out of fear, but certainly out of great expectation. We're urged to watch. We're urged to be, um, you know, to be vigilant and today to be joyful. Because we're filled with expectation. As you know, in Advent, we spend the first three weeks trying to, you know, and, and contemplating and preparing for the second coming of Christ in glory and majesty. Next week, we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to talk about and meditate more and be prepared to celebrate his first coming in humility and in poverty. So the Lord is near. There is this expectation. And for, it, was for, it was for them, so it is for us. This time of penitential preparation and expectation. It's kind of like, if you need that kind of, what should it feel like? What should Advent feel like? It should be, you know, we've got, hopefully, we've got, sometimes you've got friends who come in from the airport, and there's the chute there now. Um, it used to be you'd be waiting at the gate, but now um, you sit and you wait at the chute as they're getting ready to come out, and all these people start coming out. Is that them? No. Is that them? No. Is that them? No. What's taking them so long? Must have been in the back of the plane. And then, sure enough, you get that little glimpse, someone's like, yes, there they are. Yeah. You know, it's cool. I mean, it's, we all get that little rush, right? And, it's, uh, and that's a lot of what this is all about. It's a lot of what it's about. That's the kind of feeling we're looking for in Advent and the kind of expectation. And we know that the Lord, because we know that they're near. We know we've already been texted. They've, we've come from the cell phone lot, and we're waiting at the chute because they said we've landed. I'll be coming out soon. All right. So we've got all the signs of the times they're there. They're, we know they're there. We know that they are near, and we're just waiting for them to show up. So it is, too, in Advent. And there's kind of three ways and three levels that the Lord is near for us. And so uh, just really quickly on these three. You know, we do look forward to Christ coming in glory at the end of the age. But we are very aware that the church, and especially in the sacraments, the Lord is truly and substantially in our midst, within reach, as Paul says. And Advent helps us to become aware that Christ comes to us in little ways. Like our whatever, like the small groups that, we, that pray together, and there's lots of them, or the Bible study groups, or any of those. In our daily devotions, in our personal reading of scripture, in our ten minutes prayer, and so on, the Lord comes to us when we gather or when we pause in our day. And you need to be getting there your 10 minutes a day so that the Lord can be near to your heart. Oh, leave that door open for the Holy Spirit so the Lord can come. You know, and as he is doing today, right now, he comes to us in sacramental ways, truly and substantially present, especially in the sacrament of reconciliation, and I should say especially in the holy sacrifice of the Mass and in adoration where the Lord is truly in our midst 
truly and substantially. Christ is truly and substantially present in two places, heaven and in the Eucharist. And uh, so the Lord is indefinitely near in the sacraments. It's a wonderful thing to be Catholic because of how close our God is with us. And finally, we are indeed filled with expectation that the coming of the Lord in glory at the end of the age is near. And what that's going to mean, I don't know, but it can sometimes be a scary thing for a lot of folks. Hollywood likes to make us huge and scary and outrageous. And, you know, they have the tribulation, but it's nothing that prior Christians in other centuries and certain Christians in certain parts of the world, southern Sudan, China, Southeast Asia, other places, are not, even experience, are not experiencing even now. But for those who persevere to the end, it is really is a cause for rejoicing, isn't it? It's the fulfillment of all of our hopes, all of our expectations, the fulfillment and the culmination of all things and the created order and the new heaven and a new earth. It is, and we rejoice as we anticipate the fulfillment of our ultimate hope and the eternity of things. So Advent's kind of fun. And then this third Sunday of Advent, we pause for a time for rejoicing, expectation of the coming of the Lord in ways both big and small, both sacramental and practical, and eventually eschatological, the end of time. And I guess in all of this, no matter how he should choose to come to us, that he would find us watchful and ready when he comes so that we might recognize him.